Dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the view from the Thorax Center for Radcliffe Cardiology. This time uh, a wrap up of the AHA 2022 in Chicago. Uh, as always, my name is Nicolas van Michem and I'm doing this together with my good friend and colleague Joost Dame. Joost, um, what about uh, ischemia extent? That was, uh, that was a trial that we wanted to discuss first. Yeah, so a lot of interesting studies presented at AHA this year. Uh, one of the trials that we picked was ischemia extended. So as you recall, ischemia was the big blockbuster from 2018, randomizing 5,200 um, 5, patients with uh, stable uh, ischemia and uh, proven coronary artery disease, so either an uh, invasive strategy or an optimal medical uh, therapy strategy and the trial actually showed no difference in the, in the primary endpoint being uh, any death, MI, uh, repeat uh, hospitalization for unstable angina, resuscita resuscitated cardiac uh, arrest. Now, um, what we've seen in 2018 is that there was no difference in the primary endpoint. However, there was a trend towards somewhat higher uh, rates of non-cardiovascular death in the invasive arm. Uh, and there was also a trend towards uh, crossing event curves uh, with respect to myocardial infarction uh, after one year in favor of the uh, invasive arm, hinting into a direction of a lower risk of MI at the long term in patients who underwent a PCI. That was at a median follow-up of 3.2 years. Now in the extended cohort, we are now six, seven years uh, down the line. The uh, median follow-up uh, reached 5.7 years. 93% of the patients actually were followed up. But what appeared in this presentation by Judith Hockman is that they only look for mortality. I could have known, but, but it was not completely clear to me. But 93% uh, data complete for uh, mortality with uh, some form of, of adjudication. Uh, and what happened actually is that at 5.7 years, the uh, endpoint all-cause mortality remained completely similar between both arms with a numerical difference in favor of the PCI arm of 0.7%. However, looking at the uh, cardiovascular mortality rates, there was, there was actually a significant difference in uh, cardiovascular mortality in favor of the PCI arm, which was maybe interesting. Um, the authors did some subgroup analysis and actually found a very consistent treatment effect with uh, respect to the uh, overall endpoint of any death, uh, but with respect to uh, cardiovascular death that appeared to be mostly related to the subgroup of patients with multivessel disease. Conversely, and this you could have known since the overall endpoint was, was, was neutral, was that there was an excess of non-cardiovascular death in the PCR arm as well. So, that said, I think it's it's very little to it's very difficult to uh, to to make a final uh, adjudication on these findings. Uh, at the end, I think the data confirms that PCI is a reasonable strategy for those with uh, stable angina. And I have to say, I was a little bit disappointed about the fact that there was no data on repeat hospitalizations and specifically MI. Yeah, I think we need to be careful with uh, overemphasizing and overanalyzing mm -hmm. this study because, uh, you know, back in the day when the New England paper came out, we wrote a letter to the editor mm -hmm. also uh, questioning the validity of the study because it took very long to enroll these patients yeah. in, in, a, in, I think, 300 sites. Yeah. And then uh, a third of the patients were asymptomatic mm -hmm. at the time of entering yeah. the study and then uh, there was 15% of the patients who didn't even have uh, demonstra demonstrable clear ischemia. Mm. So I, don't, I find it very difficult and this trial will not be uh, the, the trial that will uh, be a definite answer or a definite guideline to our practice. I think yeah. um, you, know, you have to interact with your patients and uh, you have to explain that there is a, a, a medical treatment and an invasive treatment. and. You know, both treatment yeah. strategies have their pro and cons, and, yeah. and I would be more personally in favor, obviously, of, for an invasive uh, strategy, and I feel strengthened by this trial. Yeah, no, I agree, and I agree. And what I also think is that, again, um, this makes you think about the value of, of endpoints like CV death, which are always a little bit arbitrary, specifically if, if, if death of unknown causes is included. Yeah. So that is something I think which, which is a general scientific take on this trial and uh, uh, for the rest, uh, yeah, I think it's, it, it, it's, it's reassuring and uh, no, no striking findings.
heart failure. Yeah, we have a section on heart failure. The first trial that we wanted to uh, discuss is the Transform HF. That was a so-called pragmatic open-label study, mm -hmm. uh, randomizing heart failure patients to furosemide or tor torsamide. And uh, the issue is that torsamide probably or maybe have some antifibrotic uh, effects, also have better bioavailability, yep. a longer duration of action, also an, also an anti-aldosterone effect, exactly. so all kind of good yep. things. So the question was, will that have an effect on outcome? Well, um, a significant number of patients were randomized, but initially they were attempting to include 6,000 patients. Oh. Well, they have been enrolling for 3.5 years and then the DSMB halted the study or oh. made the suggestion to stop uh, enrolling. Uh, and basically it turns out uh, because of futility. There was no difference in the yeah. two treatment arms. So uh, patients, whether they were taking furosemide or torsemide, okay. uh, no difference in the, the primary endpoint of cardiovascular mortality, also no differences in secondary endpoints of rehospitalization and quality of life. Uh, I think one of the, and I was not so surprised, um, one of the intriguing parts was, okay, but this pragmatic design, did that help with finding uh, patients and so on? Well, you know, the diversity was a little bit uh, more enhanced, if you will. So one in three of the patients mm -hmm. were black, were non-Caucasians, and one in three of the patients were uh, women. So that might uh, have been a consequence of this pragmatic design. Um, I think this is this is notable. Uh, we'll see in the future whether these kind of studies will become more in vogue. Yep, yep, I agree. I think it's a, it was an interesting trial with an uh, with a potentially very interesting agent. Um, in a trial, it turned out to be very neutral, but, and it will um, not affect our uh, our practice. Will not will affect it? our practice, but um, we'll come back to that later. But what I think again, also in trials like this, uh, with with thirty percent of, of of people from uh, from from Afro American background, etc., uh, more female patients, both groups uh, which are known to be. Uh, uh, more vulnerable to treatment non-adherence. So this is something that, uh, yeah, that may, uh, may have impacted the result of this trial as well. Yeah. The Iron other, Man. The Iron Man study, that was a, a, a trial that looked into the effects of IV iron therapy in patients with heart failure. Um, patients were, two thirds of the patients were admitted to, uh, to the hospital with an acute mm -hmm. episode of uh, heart failure. Mm -hmm. And then they were uh, randomized in 72 sites. It was a UK trial. Yeah. Almost 1200 patients were enrolled, uh, one to one randomized to either IV iron therapy or just standard of care. Right. Interestingly, all the patients had iron deficiency, proven iron deficiency. They were not necessarily anemic, but they had iron deficiency. And then they looked at the primary endpoint of all-cause mortality and heart failure hospitalizations. And to my surprise, there was no difference. So the primary endpoint was missed, although there was a strong trend in favor of the intravenous iron therapy. We anticipated that, that this would end up being a positive study because at the end of the day, we are talking about patients with iron deficiency and heart failure. But yeah, we have to acknowledge that the primary endpoint was missed Yet they also did a pre-specified analysis, as they mentioned, uh, where they looked at uh, the patients before, prior to the COVID uh, uh, era. And then in that sub-analysis, the trial was significantly better in favor uh, of uh, IV iron therapy. I think for me, still, I was, um, I'm a little bit underwhelmed because um, if you look further in the data, there was also no effect of iron therapy on heart failure hospitalizations or on improvements in quality of life. So in, 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 in aggregate, I would say IV iron therapy, when there is iron deficiency, yes. Should we look for it? Yes. And it's complementary on top of uh, the, you know, the big five in heart failure ther medical therapy, but I, sh I would not put it at the same level. No, I, I tend to agree specifically not in patients who are non-anemic. And yeah. I think that is that yeah. that that was to me a little bit the, yeah. the 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 striking finding in this trial that it it was maybe a bit 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 ambitious. Yeah. Well, but you know there is this other trial at uh, the uh, for the Affirm AHF yeah. that was also published in Lancet, same as this paper, mm -hmm. by the way, um, that also just made its uh, uh, its primary mm -hmm. endpoint uh, in favor of IV iron therapy. So if you if you combine both studies, then probably you will end up with uh, mm. with a significant benefit. But um, yeah, 
I think we had a, we expected more. Yep. And then the last one in uh, the heart failure context is more focusing on acute heart failure. And that was a, a trial that uh, we looked uh, very much forward to. That was the ECMO CS trial from yeah. the Czech Republic. Um, the 122 patients with um, cardiogenic shock stage D or E, so advanced cardiogenic yeah. shock, were enrolled in this study. And interestingly, only 117 patients yeah. were eventually analyzed. So what happened to the other five patients? Well, they all died before consent was taken. And you know, if the patient was not able uh, to, to, uh, to sign consent or to provide a verbal consent, then a next of kin was approached. Well, still, they did not manage to do that, the investigators, in five patients. And um, uh, important to mention that fi all those five patients mm -hmm. died. So uh, that becomes important later on. 50% uh, of the patients uh, underwent also a revascularization, predominantly uh, PCIs, and 50% did not get a revascularization. Then if you look at um, the outcomes, there was no difference in the primary uh, outcome of mortality, resuscitation, or... Um, Crossover. Uh, well, the crossover, yeah, that, crossover, but escalation to, escalation to yeah. a mechanical circulatory support. And yeah. talking about crossover, up to 40% of the control arm eventually mm -hmm. got an ECMO uh, on average uh, 1.9 days after uh, study enrollment. So it was, uh, that makes it a little bit difficult to interpret, but still there was no signal and there was also um, no difference whether you would only look at the patient's uh, who underwent a revascularization mm. or mm. in the patients who had um, a stage D or a stage E a cardiogenic shock. Also of importance, 80% of the patients were already on noradrenaline before they entered the study. Sure. So that, the, that really underscores that they were all in uh, quite an advanced yep. cardiogenic shock. Yep. I think 50% uh, of the, well, if you look at the, um, at the uh, at the endpoints per se, so all the single endpoints, the single variables. Then you see, if you look at mortality, fifty percent of the patients were dead at thirty days, and only and this is quite um, sobering. Only twelve percent of the patients were discharged home at thirty days. All the other patients were either dead, still in hospital, or in a rehabilitation center. And I think these data are quite similar to the IBP shock 2 data from Holger yeah. Thiele in the past. So that means that, you know, we need to get better in identifying the patients earlier. earlier if we exactly. think about mechanical yeah. circulatory support, we have to think about it yeah. earlier when the patients are in a pre-shock stadium. So a sky stage B or C, and then uh, the question is still, maybe a balloon pump can still work in that, in that context. And this is definitely something that we are very interested uh, to study uh, down the stretch. I think sample size was a little bit too small to uh, make definite answers. Uh, at the same time, there were also some missing data. We don't no. know what kind of venting was used. Was there systematic venting? Because if we uh, yeah. implant ECMOs these days, we will do a systematic venting with at least with a balloon, balloon pump. pump. Yeah. Um, that was not described. Uh, so definitely more studies uh, are needed and are also on the way. Yep, yep, yep. Very interesting study. I think it was a, was a great try for something that still needs a final randomized mm -hmm. confirmation. Yeah. But this trial, again, to me, shows the complexity of, of doing trials like this. I mean, we got too much used to having these devices available and with a, with a escalation rate of 40% and a control arm. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it becomes difficult to, uh, to prove superiority at the end in a, uh, in a hard, hard, hard point. Yeah, but at the same time, it also shows that it, it's not necessary to be overly aggressive immediately when you are mm -hmm. confronted with a patient like this. And yeah. I think if you then look at a the little bit of a, a bigger mm -hmm. picture, that means that not all institutions need to have ECMO. You have time to, yeah. That, basically, that is, that is an interesting the, take, optimal, the optimal timing yeah. is, is, is already gone. So mm. I think uh, there is also a signal to harm. Don't forget that uh, there was no statistical difference, but numerically there were, uh, there were only strokes, three yeah. strokes in the ECMO arm, and there were 50% more bleedings and vascular complications and that's, lack ischemia in the ECMO arm. 
And the only reason why it was not statistically significant was obviously because the sample size was so small. So there is a price to pay and there is, in my opinion, a signal to harm uh, when you use an ECMO uh, inappropriately. Yep. So uh, hyperlipidemia, that was uh, only one study that we wanted to highlight. Um, um, it's another study on the Eicosapentone pentaonic <laughs> acid, the EPA in short. Uh, this study was a study from uh, Japan and we already uh, in our preview mentioned that, uh, you know, there's quite some interest for this drug because this is potentially over-the-counter available. Mm -hmm. um, um, 2,500 patients in Japan were randomized one-to-one -to, -one to either a statin therapy or statin on top with EPA on top of it, and all patients had a chronic coronary syndrome. Mm -hmm. Mean age was 68 years old, 80% were male, and then the primary endpoint was any basically cardiovascular event. Turns out that at four years, there was no difference between the two treatment arms, but then you saw that the curves were separating, and at six years, there was a 4% absolute reduction in this primary composite endpoint, mm -hmm. and if you look at mortality, cardiovascular mortality, also there was a 1% absolute reduction. I think um, quite uh, promising. I was impressed by, by the study results, but uh, the trialists themselves, the investigators, they said, well, listen, we have to be cautious Careful. to extrapolate mm. also to a Western population because these were all Japanese patients and the yeah. EPA levels in uh, a Japanese uh, population is always higher than yeah. in a Western population. So the dosing might be different. This study was uh, using an 1800 milligram dose of EPA. Mm. Still, I'm a believer in the EPA and uh, I, uh, I expect more studies with this uh, over-the-counter uh, drug. Alrighty, but you're not convinced. You know, I, I'm I'm a little bit reluctant to 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 overinterpret these findings. I mean, there's been a lot of data on 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 supplements like this. Uh, I mean, it's 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 a very well tolerated over the counter drug, and if it works, I mean, it's great. But conversely, I mean, what do we see? We see after one year a one percent difference in again CV cardiovascular six mortality years, eh? six at six years, years. Yeah. but after four years uh, of of cardiovascular mortality. I would not overinterpret that, but again, plus it's a population which has a completely different uh, disease pathology, a higher risk of stroke, lower risk of MIs, uh, which may also impact the the, the incidence of uh, of mortality down the stretch. So um, I agree, it's interesting, uh, promising, but it needs confirmation. Yeah. Hypertension. Hypertension. Okay, now it's uh, up to you. Yours. Now it's up to me. So this, you know, as you know, is one of my uh, one of my favorite topics, uh, and specifically the difficult to treat part. So as you know, um, there are uh, multiple invasive options now um, being tested to to treat uh, therapy resistant or difficult to treat hypertension. But it's good to see that now also at the AHA there were two drugs uh, presented, so two drug trials with novel agents that uh, could be used to improve uh, blood pressure control in patients with uh, therapy-resistant hypertension. One was the precision trial uh, studying aprocitentan in patients with resistant hypertension. So this was a randomized control trial designed to, uh, to show the blood pressure lowering effect of the dual endothelin uh, antagonist aprocitentan, idorsia. Mm -hmm. Uh, which is a new drug uh, when added to uh, other antihypertensive drugs uh, of patients with resistant hypertension. 730 patients randomized within this trial to two doses of the drug, so 12 and a half or 25 milligrams or placebo. Uh, actually, the trial had three parts. So Michael Schleich, uh, Michael Schleich presented the data, published it simultaneously in Lancet. Uh, so that can, uh, you can use as a reference. Uh, three parts within the trial. One was the four-week uh, endpoint, which actually was, I think, the primary with a uh, uh, power to show a superiority in reducing systolic office blood pressure. That was significant actually with a uh, 3.7 millimeters of redu uh, reduction in systolic office based blood pressure and a 5.9 millimeters reduction in the systolic uh, 24 ABPM um, blood pressure which is 40 a, 25 uh, milligram dose which is a, it's a reason right? definitely significant and also i think a clinically meaningful yeah. reduction so as you know five millimeters of mercury reduction reflects approximately a 10 percent reduction in the risk of death stroke and mi so i think six is, uh, is 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 significant and more or less equal to what you would expect of a full dose of a, of a angiotensin 2 antagonist or a, a calcium antagonist so this is on top of these these other three drugs a uh, promising new agent 
Uh, in terms of side effects, 10 to 20% fluid retention. So this again shows the downside of adding drugs. Mm. 10 to 20% of moderate, uh, mild to moderate fluid retention. I think it's, 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 it's not extremely much, but it's, it's, a, it's a number that, that can be relevant in, in clinical practice in patients of whom we know when they use four or more drugs are uh, starting to get non-compliant. Uh, and we'll get to that uh, in a second, obviously, when we talk about renal denervation. But again, a promising drug. And it would also be uh, interesting to get a little bit more granularity on this mild to moderate fluid retention, because obviously we're all familiar with this mm. side effect of calcium antagonists. Absolutely. And so what happens if you combine calcium antagonists with this, uh, this kind of therapies? Will mm. it get even worse or do they, you know, are... Is, yeah, yeah. yeah, most most patients within this trial were already on a calcium antagonist. Mm. I don't have the exact figure now, but okay. uh, that that I think was substantial. Okay. Brighton. The second uh, agent, which was perhaps a bit more impressive, was Brighton. So this is a uh, trial looking at the aldosterone synthetase inhibitor. So this is not a aldosterone, uh, um, aldosterone receptor blocker like spironolactone, but a actually uh, synthetase inhibitor. So it blo it, it blocks the uh, the production, the synthesis of the uh, of aldosterone. So very interesting agent, uh, which was uh, presented by Mason Freeman in a phase two trial called uh, Brighton. 248 patients randomized uh, to Baxlostat, uh, 0.5, 1 or 2 milligrams or uh, placebo. Uh, and what was interesting, again, uh, patients with resistant hypertension, a primary endpoint of systolic office-based blood pressure, and this trial showed a uh, 20 millimeters uh, reduction in uh, office systolic blood pressure in patients that were put on a 2 milligram dose of Baxlostat, uh, which was at the end a 10% difference to the placebo arm, in which a 10 millimeters difference was observed in terms which of blood pressure. Which is also a lot, eh? 10 in a placebo arm is a lot. Yeah. And that in, in comparison to the other trial in which it was, was I think, 2 or 3, is, is substantial. And I think th at least 3 times higher as you would expect in most uh, most trials with the, with the placebo arm. That said, I think a delta of over 10, what this trial showed, is, is something that we've very rarely seen in, uh, in history. I think if you look at the phase two with spironolactone, uh, it was, uh, or the pathway two with spironolactone, it was, wasn't that impressive. It was also around seven millimeters of mercury. But now 20 is, uh, is impressive. Um, also this drug, safe, well tolerated, uh, but yet six patients with hyperkalemia, as you would expect with uh, with these agents. How long was the follow up? Follow up in these patients was, I think, twelve weeks. Okay, so, so then, yeah, so short. But, yeah, uh, short, but quite an impressive uh, drop in uh, in in blood pressure. Then minus twenty and minus ten in the placebo arm. Yeah. Hmm. That so that really begs for a for a large phase three randomized. Absolutely, study. and I'm yeah. pretty sure that that will that will come uh, soon. So also yeah. this trial published simultaneously in the New England. Then finally, uh, for me, something Renal I really looked out for the spiral HTN on med trial. So as you recall, this is the large pivotal trial of uh, Medtronic, uh, which they will use for their uh, FDA submission to get this therapy reimbursed in the, in the US. So uh, as you recall, uh, the trial presented its pilot findings already in 2018, 80 patients uh, randomized two to one with uh, difficult to control hypertension to RDN with a spiral device versus uh, sham. And this trial showed in the pilot a 7.3 millimeters uh, difference in systolic ambulatory blood pressure in favor of the RDN therapy. So very highly significant uh, blood pressure reduction that uh, actually uh, raised very positive sentiment when looking into the full trial that was uh, aimed to enrolling uh, 337 patients. Uh, however, uh, this trial took place during COVID. 80% of patients in the extended arm were uh, enrolled during the COVID pandemic, and that appeared to have affected the endpoint. Mm. So what did the trial show? At six months, a, a delta in a 24 hour ABPM of minus 1.9 millimeters mm. of mercury. So with that, <laughs> the trial obviously missed its primary endpoint. Um, and this is interesting. This makes you think, how could the pilot show a difference of minus 7.3? In the extended phase, the delta was zero. Mm -hmm. Zero. No, no treatment effect at all. Um, and then that resulted in a net delta in a 24-hour ABPM of minus 2, minus mm -hmm. 1.9. So what happened? Um, the 
Investigators David Ganzari, who presented the trial, obviously focused on the secondary endpoints. Office BP actually did reach significance with a difference of 5 millimeters of mercury. And also when using a win rate to approach, so looking either at a decrease in blood pressure or an increase in drugs or decrease in drugs, the uh, RDN arm uh, was uh, obviously the, the winner in terms of, of, of using the win ratio. So what happened? Um, we had a very close look into all the data, into to trying to explain why this could happen. And as already alluded to in our preview, this trial enrolled patients being on one, two or three drugs and had an endpoint at six months. So that meant there were six months for patients to either decrease their drugs or increase their drugs. What happened in the pilot phase is that was very rare, five versus seven percent at the net um, increase or decrease in drugs. So no difference between sham and RDN arm and not that frequent, five versus seven percent. But now in the extended cohort, what happened is that what is a two percent increase in drugs in the RDN arm, which is virtually nothing, but a 22% increase in drugs in the sham arm, something that was uh, mostly due again to the, to the, as mentioned already earlier, in the black uh, American subgroup. And so may reflect some socioeconomic impact of the, of the changes in drugs. Um, so that at least explains the lower delta. And then why was the office BP uh, positive and the 24 hour ABPM negative? That is interesting because compliance was measured, but now assume, or not assume, but uh, consider the fact that office BP was measured in the hospital early in the morning when the patients did or did not take their drugs. And then it appeared that RDN patients had a lower BP. But then patients needed to do witness drug intake at the outpatient clinic with the drugs they used at that point in time with 20% more drugs in the sham group as com compared to the RDN arm. And that obviously explains why the delta in 24 hour ABPM was significantly lower because the patients in the sham arm obviously had clearly higher numbers of drugs as compared to those in the RDN arm. So at the end, a uh, finding I think that is uh, explainable, but um, yeah, I mean, it's also something that, that will give Medtronic likely a difficult time within the uh, within the uh, the F their FDA or IDE submission. Uh, they may, may be facing a panel, but um, yet this is a trial I think that should be seen in light of now six sham controlled randomized trials that all hinted in the same direction. The 24 hour blood pressure lowering effect of RDN was very consistent across all trials, six millimeters of mercury also in this trial. Yet this trial had the sham arm with a blood pressure reduction of 4 to 5, which at the end was higher than expected and resulted in a negative trial. So I think they still have a good case. Um, I'm still a very strong believer in the therapy and uh, I hope the community will be able to appreciate these findings as they are and uh, appreciate the fact that uh, drugs do work, but... Um, as compared to uh, drugs, RDN is a therapy that significantly lowers blood pressure. Well, and, and I think you always have to be cognizant for the fact that it, it's very difficult to keep uh, patients compliant, yep. hypertension, hypertension patients compliant mm. to their medical reg regimen. So that is where I see as the sweet spot for um, renal denervation at this point, and that, that could become a huge mm. market. At the same time, I think uh, we need more robust trials. Mm. I mean, these are relatively small trials. Um, and a lot can happen within studies that you're just not counting and that, mm. that just uh, happens under the radar of the investigator. So, uh, but I, I agree with you, there, there are multiple studies. We're not talking about one study. There are multiple sham controlled studies now that all are consistently pointing in the same direction. So I do hope we, uh, we uh, get that next wave of, uh, of big trials. Um, one question still for you, Joost, is there a difference in the kind of um, uh, renal denervation uh, therapy or technique that you use? I mean, obviously you, uh, this was uh, the Ardian um, renal denervation system from, uh, from Medtronic, but you also have uh, ultrasound-based uh, uh, technology. The kind of reduction that you can expect, is it the same for all these devices? Based on these trials, the reduction you get with RDN, irrespective of whether you use alcohol, uh, ultrasound, or uh, multi-electrode uh, radio frequency denervation, as uh, within this trial, which patients received, I think, on average 45 ablation points across the, uh, the renal arteries, including uh, larger accessories, 
But the overall treatment effect is more or less identical. Mm -hmm. uh, yet, there are no comparative uh, studies as of today. The only one was radio sound that hinted into a direction of, of superiority of ultrasound. However, not as compared to spiral, but more as compared to the flex, which is no longer on the market. Mm -hmm. So at present, I don't think there's any reason to believe that one device is superior to the other. Uh, although I think the, the concept of aiming for a circumferential ablation uh, irrespective of how you do that is a, is a given fact that we, uh, we need to try to, uh, to aim for. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, then two more trials that we did not preview, but we do want to mention it in the wrap-up. One is the early AF trial that was published in the New England Journal. 300 patients with paroxysmal atrial oh. fibrillation were randomized to cryoablation therapy or to antiarrhythmic drugs. Mm. And their primary endpoint was the occurrence of persistent atrial fibrillation. So the patients had paroxysmal mm. AF when they entered the study. And the primary endpoint was then, okay, but how many of those patients developed persistent atrial fibrillation? Well, there was a significant difference in favor of the cryoablation, 1.7% versus 7.4% very low numbers sure. uh, and if you then look at the co-primary endpoint of atrial tachyarrhythmias it was 56 percent mm. in the cryoablation arm versus 77 percent uh, in the medical uh, treatment arm so um, there was also a difference in hospital admissions so fewer hospital admissions in the cryoablation arm but i was a little bit surprised about um, basically the recurrence rate of uh, atrial tachyarrhythmias uh, in the treatment mm. arm so I, I was at the end of the day i was a little bit underwhelmed also about the the size of the study yeah. so i think there is still a play of chance here um but still it got in the new england um <laughs> <clears throat> yeah it's it's a little bit of a strange thing i think Yep, I agree. I think there's a lot to learn on these, uh, on these trials. Uh, the way you measure the endpoint, is it the hospitalizations? Is mm. it the loop recorder recordings you put? Is it the, 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 the rhythm or the AFib burden you measure with an implantable device like a pacemaker or an ICD? I think that makes a huge, huge difference. Mm. And the, the, the volatility of the endpoint of, of having yeah. uh, AFib is, is, is something that I think is a, is, is a relatively soft endpoint. Yeah, it is. And I'm, I'm amazed that, you know, the, the kind of attraction that yeah. this gets and that basically the entire space of a, yeah. AF ablation gets, mm -hmm. you know, the scientific background is not the same as the scientific background, for instance, for uh, heart failure therapies or Absolutely. for uh, hypertension therapy. Yeah. So, so yeah. it's, it's, it's amazing. So I would, I would have liked a larger trial with a larger sample size so that, you know, mm -hmm. the play of chance, you know, is, uh, is minimized. Yep. But okay, another interesting study was the DOSE VF trial. And I think this can change our practice. We're talking about 405 patients with refractory ventricular fibrillation. Mean age of the patients, 64 years old, a minority of women, only 15%. Mm -hmm. And then they compared three regimens of defibrillation. Mm -hmm. So the patients already had three cycles of standard uh, ventricular defibrillation mm -hmm. and adrenaline therapies. And the standard of care, obviously, is one set of defib pads. You put one anterior and one lateral. Now, they compared it to um, a different positioning of the pads, one anterior, mm. one posterior, and then a third group. And this was an interesting group, was the double sequential external defibrillation. So the the patient got two sets of pads, oh. one anteroposterior and one anterolateral. And then the patients, within a second, were defibrillated twice. Mm. So they compared those three groups. And then their primary endpoint was the survival to hospital <laughs> discharge. And then there was a strong, I mean, there was a clear benefit in favor of these new um, uh, algorithms. So if you compare the, the outcome, it was 13% in the standard with the defib pads anterior lateral versus 21% in uh, the changing of the vector, anteroposterior, and it was 30% uh, in the patients with sequential, double sequential external defibrillation. So this new concept of defibrillating patients really made sense. And if you look at the return of spontaneous circulation, the results were even more impressive. So a quarter of the patients 
uh, had a ROSC if you had the conventional way of defibrillating, mm. it, it um, increased to almost 50% in the patients with these double sequential external defibrillation. So I do feel that uh, there is something to gain here in a group of patients with a very, very grim prognosis. Mm. And I think rightfully so. This was also published in the New England Journal because this will change our standard of, of care if we would adopt this in our practice. I agree. Extremely relevant. Um, something that in theory is, is maybe relatively easy to implement. Yeah. Um, the only thing, I mean, looking into our own practice, a survival rate after three times VFib of 13%, that does not reflect our practice. And I think doesn't reflect, reflect the practice in many out-of-hospital cardiac arrest trials. But yet... Um, Early hospital the, discharge. The, the, the results are striking. Early I hospital to, discharge is, is never be, does not never go beyond thirty percent. Eh? Thirty, but this is thirteen. Yeah, but this well. is what you get in a in a randomized mm -hmm. study and an out of hospital. Yeah, it depends also on on patient selection mm -hmm. and so on eh? yeah. because a lot of the patients. Uh, a lot of studies also um, enroll patients who arrive to the hospital, and then mm -hmm. obviously that changes the paradigm. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I think. Uh, I think we had a, a set of very interesting studies uh, again at this year's uh, yeah. AHA. Um, I would like to thank Joost uh, once again for uh, doing the wrap-up together with me. I would like to thank you for your attention. And uh, we're gearing up for all the meetings next year. Stay tuned. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.